Okay, Spence, why was it cold in the screenwriter's house? Because he was working on his final draft. <laughs> oh, come on, it wasn't that bad, was it? Hello, filmmakers, and welcome to Film It Yourself. Today, I'll be answering your filmmaking questions, so let's get started. So, we have a question here from Lolita, and Lolita asks, how do you color correct a video? Do you have to do it frame by frame? Because that sounds very time consuming. Or is it built into all video editing programs? So great question, Lolita. And it is built into most video editing programs. And thankfully, because you have a video clip, you don't have to do it frame by frame. You can apply one color correction to the whole clip, unlike you would in photography, say, where you would have to color correct each photo. So I'm gonna show you how to do this in Premiere, and other editing softwares might look different, but the principles still apply. So let's take a look at color correction basics in Premiere. Okay, so now that I'm in Premiere, I have a sequence open with the clip that I wanna color correct in it. And the first step that you're gonna to wanna to do is you're actually going to want to put an adjustment layer on top of your clip. So if you don't already have an adjustment layer in your project, you can create a new one by clicking the new item icon down here and selecting adjustment layer. And that will automatically generate an adjustment layer for you. So I'll click okay. And now I'm going to just drag it on top of my clip and make sure that I stretch it so that it fits all the way across the clip. So an adjustment layer might not be an option in every editing software. This might be mainly an Adobe Premiere thing. So if you don't have one, feel free to put your color correction and filter on your actual clip. But the nice part about an adjustment layer in Adobe Premiere Pro is that it helps you quickly identify which clips have color correction on them. So if I had a sequence with a bunch of clips, I could quickly look down the line and be like, oh, this clip has an adjustment layer above it. So that means that I've already color corrected it. So that's an easy way to visually see that. And then also by putting the color correction on the adjustment layer and not the clip, you're able to toggle the color correction on and off so that you can see the before and after. And if you don't know what an adjustment layer is, it's just basically a blank container that you can put any filters you want on and then it affects the clip below it. So it's almost like putting it on the clip, but the nice part is it's not actually on the clip so that you can quickly toggle it on and off. So now that we have an adjustment layer, we need to add our Lumetri color correction filter. So that's this right here in Premiere. If you're not using Premiere, just whatever color correction filter you have in the software you're using. So I'm gonna grab my Lumetri color correction filter and just drop it right on my adjustment layer. And then I'll go to my effects control and scroll down. And here you will see it has been applied to the adjustment layer. So Lumetri color correction has several different categories here. You can see there's a basic correction. So a basic correction would be what you would use to color correct. And what color correct means is to make your colors look color accurate. So you're gonna wanna make the whites look normal whites and blacks look normal black, stuff like that. So that's where you would do your first correction. Then you have a creative category and this is where you would do your color grading. And color grading is basically when you put a look to your film. So it's the difference between color correction and color grading is color correction is making your colors look accurate. And then color grading is what you apply after that to give it a filmic cinematic look. And don't worry, we will get into each of these. Then you also have curves. So if you prefer to use curves, you can use that. There's color wheels, so you can adjust the shadows, midtone, and highlights individually. And then there's HLS secondary, which don't worry, I know this looks overwhelming. We'll get into this later. And then a vignette, if you want to apply a vignette to your footage. So before we actually get in and start doing our color correction, it's super important that we have our color scopes up. So if you go to window and you go down to Lumetri scopes and select that, it's going to open up these scopes. And whenever you're color correcting, it's super important to have scopes open because scopes are going to tell you exactly what's going on. It's easy to just color correct by eye and be like, it looks good, but scopes are going to give you the actual data 
of whether or not you're overexposed, underexposed, all that information. So you can see here we have two scopes on the left is a color scope and this is going to tell you if your colors are illegal. So illegal colors are colors that go past this bounding box here. And what that means is that it's illegal for broadcast. It's too saturated for broadcast and it's not going to display properly on a broadcast TV. So let's say for example that your film got distribution and you had illegal colors in your color correction the distribution company is probably going to ask you to recolor correct. So this is super important to make sure that your colors are not illegal. And then to the right over here, we have a basic histogram. And this is going to show you at the top, it's going to show you things that are overexposed and the bottom, it's going to show you things that are underexposed. Currently, we don't have anything underexposed, which is great. And at the very top, it looks like we have a little tiny bit overexposed. You can see that this is actually a light that's reflected in a picture frame that I have hanging on the wall. And because it's a light, I'm okay with it being overexposed. I'm probably never gonna recover those details. So that's fine with me. I just wanna make sure that the whites on the table and the wall don't also peak and go over 100. You can also see here in our histogram that there's sort of an overarching line here around 70, and that's probably this white background here. And for skin tones, you wanna make sure that skin tones are falling around 70. For someone who is fair of skin, obviously individuals who are darker skin are going to fall on a darker point on your histogram, but for light skinned people, you're looking for around 70. So that's a good base to look for when color correcting. Okay, so now that I have my scopes open, we can start to do a basic color correction. And I have that tab open here. So the first thing you're gonna wanna do is select the white balance selector. Now, it's super important that when you shoot your footage, you're white balancing correctly in camera. So to do that, you wanna make sure that you're white balancing with a white balance card, or you can also use some of the custom or automatic settings in your camera. But to get the best white balance possible, I highly recommend a white balance card. But in this scenario, I happen to have a white wall behind me, which is perfect for this. So I'm going to click this white balance selector and then I'm just going to click on an area of the wall that looks fairly white. And once I do that, you can see automatically Premiere changes the color temperature and the tint. So the color temperature is going to either get bluer or orangier, depending on if you have tungsten or daylight in your scene. And then the tint is going to either be a green or magenta tint this sometimes happens with footage, you get a green tint or a magenta tint. So a tint will help you get rid of that. But the automatic white balance selector is actually pretty good in Premiere. So if you happen to have a nice white source to select from, give it a try. So now that I have it white balanced, we're going to get into the nitty gritty here. So we're going to get into the tone section. So if my footage was underexposed, so you can see it looked something like this, then I would definitely want to bring up the exposure. But my footage is actually pretty well exposed because I'm super white. I'm actually probably falling around the same point as 70 already. So the same point as the white wall, you can see the white wall here. This is probably me right here. <laughs> so I don't need to, adjust the exposure, but this is definitely something you can do. What I suggest is take it slow, maybe do 0.2 at a time, because you can see 0.2 actually jumps it quite a bit up. Of course, there's contrast. It's always good to maybe add just like a little bit of contrast. Let's see, maybe 10, that looks good. Our highlights, so as we can see that one highlight is peaking, the rest of our highlights and whites are falling pretty high. So I don't feel the need to raise them, but if you did, so you can see here, you can just raise the highlights overall. You can also just raise the shadows or bring them down if you wanted to make them look blacker. I think they're actually not bad where they're at. I'll probably bring the blacks down a little bit. And next is the whites. This is actually my secret sauce. So what I find usually is sometimes if an image looks muddied, 
or the whites just don't look super vibrant or even colors don't look super vibrant and everything you do doesn't seem to change that, try adjusting the whites. This shot is actually pretty good, but I've found adding somewhere around 10 or so whites just help make everything a little bit more vibrant. So you can see there, that's what it was. It kind of looks a little muddy here in the white wall versus if I bring the whites up a little bit, you can see it looks a little bit more sharper, clearer, less muddy. And then I'm going to bring my blacks down just a little bit so that Spence looks a little richer, maybe even a little bit more. So you can see here, now we're peeking on the black. Some things are underexposed, but visually I'm okay with that. We might be losing a little bit of detail here. You can see if we bring this back to zero, we might be getting a little more detail in his hair, but for now I'm okay with that. You just wanna make sure that you're not completely losing all the detail in your blacks. So for example, if I brought this all the way down, now you can really see this is called crushing the blacks. You can see we've lost a lot of detail in his fur there, so don't go that far. Okay, so now we have our basic correction. It looks pretty good. If you wanted to add some saturation, you can do that here. Oh, but you can see if I add saturation, it brings us into the illegal zone. But I'm gonna leave this saturation as is, and I'll show you how to fix that in a little bit. So let's say you still want this saturation, like you're loving the saturation in the blues and the blues are fine. We can take down just the yellows in the reds later. So I'll show you how to do that. We'll leave it like that for now. So next we're gonna move on to our creative look and this is where it gets really fun. So next we're gonna choose a LUT. Premiere calls it a look, but it's basically a LUT. And if you click this, you can see some custom ones that are already built into Premiere, but I'm gonna choose Browse and select from some custom LUTs that I already have downloaded. So LUTs are basically like, you can think of them as like a color grading look that is already made for you that you can just apply to your footage and it kind of quickly gets you a look, a color look. So I have the Grayscale Gorilla LUTs, which I really like, I use these a lot. I also have some Osiris LUTs and I have some Shutterstock LUTs that I've bought as well but I'm gonna use the Grayscale Gorilla and I'll put a link to those in the description below. But these I find are super awesome and helpful. I'm gonna click on Installers, Premiere, CC, LUT files, and they're divided into Basic, Everyday, Cinematic, Specialty, or Black and White. I'm gonna go to Basic and I really like the clean, cool look LUT. I use this one all the time. So I'm gonna click Open and it's instantly going to apply the look. You can tell right away, it looks quite different. And what I normally find is that the intensity of the LUT, when it's at 100%, is usually too much, unless you're looking for something super stylized. I'm usually not super stylized with this sort of scene, but if you are, you can leave it at 100. Otherwise, I like to bring it down to like 40, or maybe even 30. Oh, 30 looks good. And you can toggle it on and off by clicking this activate button. And look, you can see the difference already. So it's kind of cooling down the scene overall, but you can see with like Spence especially, it really makes him pop from the background. And that's the cool part about LUTs is they can really help make you pop from the background or your actors pop from the background. It's really great. There's all sorts of adjustments here. You can give it a faded film look, I guess. If that's what you're into, you can sharpen, which I would only suggest if you have a camera that you know needs sharpening. I used to do this with my 7D a lot because it wasn't the most sharpest. You can add vibrance and saturation again. I can also tint the shadows and highlights. I'm not gonna do any of that because the LUT is already basically doing all that for me, which is great. And just so you can see up here, you can also turn your basic color correction on and off again by hitting the activate checkbox. So you can do that up here as well. And when you're color correcting, it's always a good idea to toggle your color correction on and off. Like look how far we've come. So your eye is very quickly going to adapt to whatever color correction you're doing. And it's going to tell your brain like, yeah, that's white. 
So before when I looked at this clip, I used to think that's white and I didn't see the crazy color cast. So that's the other reason why having this adjustment layer is great because you can toggle it on and off and it kind of refreshes your vision and you go, oh, wow, that's what it used to look like. Cool, I'm making progress. So let's go back to our scopes. And next is curves. I personally don't use curves, so I'm gonna skip it. But if you prefer curves, they're great. But I prefer this hue saturation curve is great because it's going to help us fix this. So let's just make our saturation a little more wild. We'll bump it up five more. Oh, it actually didn't affect it that much. So we're still safe, but as you can see, we've still got the yellow and red that are illegal. So that's where this hue saturation curve is going to be a lifesaver. So if I scroll up a little bit here, you can click each color to set different sort of, for lack of a better word, I'm gonna call them keyframes, I guess, little toggle points that let you adjust how much saturation each of that area gets. So you can see here with this yellow one, as I increase it, you can see down here that the color saturates and gets super illegal. But if I bring it down, we can pull it below that line. So I'm just gonna pull it so that it's right below the line. And then I'm gonna move on to the next one. Sometimes you have to, yep, there it is. Sometimes you have to figure out which of these little adjustment toggles is the correct one. So this is the right one, pull it down right about there. And then we're looking for the red one, I bet. Oh, nope, not that one, undo that. This one, okay, there you go. So you can see here again, super illegal. And you can see on the screen, this red is screaming. I mean, this isn't pleasant to look at. So you're not gonna want it to be that saturated. So let's pull this back down to right about there. It's okay if it kisses the line, but we don't want it to go over the line. So now we still have maintained our saturation of 110 on all the other colors, but we've been able to pull down that red and the yellows so that they are not so screaming and illegal, which is super great. This is honestly one of my favorite tools in Lumetri colored. So we've got that done. Let's move on to color wheels. So color wheels are also going to help you adjust the color for a specific area, but this is going to affect the shadows, highlights, and midtones. So if you want to really give your footage a stylistic look, this is a great place to go. Or if you are just seeing a specific color cast just in the highlights or just in the shadows, this will help you adjust just those. So as you can see here, this area of my highlights is very orangey. Now it's not orangey over here, so this probably will make it too blue over here, but let's just look at this area right now. If I bring this in and I keep moving it, it's going to make that area more blue. So you can see here, I'll undo. That's what it was. That's what it is now. So you can see overall, my highlights are way more blue, which they're a little bit too blue for me, so I'm gonna undo that. But I might bring them just, maybe just a smidge. There we go, that's not too bad. And then let's say you wanted to make your shadows a certain color, you wanted to warm them up maybe. So you can see here on Spence, he's gotten really warm. Overall, this isn't looking super great, so I'll undo that. You could also make them blue. Sometimes that's the cinematic look people do. You can see the blue in his black fur there. I'll undo that. So maybe I'll just warm them up just a tiny bit. Yeah, that's better. I think the LUT was kind of cooling them off a little bit. So with the color wheels, less is more. So you really wanna be delicate, have a delicate hand with this because you can see really easily how crazy it can go if you don't have a delicate hand. And also actually I'll put that back. Another great tip that I love with this is if you've made an adjustment and you're like, this is way too much, I don't like it. You can either hit this reset parameter button, but that will reset all of them. If you just wanna reset one of them, just hold command and double click on the little plus sign and that will reset just that parameter. And you'll also see these have some sliders so you can raise the level of the midtones. 
so you can bring them down or up. So this is going to let you raise their brightness and you can see with the histogram below, that's affecting that. As I slide it up and down, you can see it affect the brightness. If I undo that also, another thing to note that's super important is when you raise the level up, it's actually going to desaturate. So you can see the colors have desaturated a bit versus if you bring it down, it's going to add some saturation. So just keep that in mind that when you affect these toggles, it's also going to affect your saturation. This is why it's super important to keep your scopes open at all times and keep an eye on them. Okay, so that's the color wheels. We've done that. Now let's get into the HSL secondary. I know this looks very scary <laughs> if you haven't color corrected before. Honestly, it used to scare me. But the HSL secondary is really great if you want to specifically just color correct a certain color. So this is going to let you set a color. So let's click the little eyedropper. And why this is great is because you can specifically dial in your skin tones. So I'm going to click on my cheek here to get my skin tones. And then here, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to click show mask. So if you show mask, I'll scroll down a little bit here. This is showing you just the colors that are selected. So everything that's gray is not selected. So we don't exactly have all of my skin tones selected. So that's where this area is going to come in handy. So we have hue. So this is going to change the hue that's selected. So if I make this wider, we should start to see, yeah. So now we're into the blue. So we're also getting some blue color there. That's not what we want. So I'll undo that. You can also slide it along. So if I slide it along, we'll be getting other colors, but this is basically around the area we want. I can extend this out a little bit to feather it, but this looks pretty good. We also have saturation. So you can see this is on the light side of the saturation versus completely saturated. So expanding this is probably gonna, yep, it's gonna get us more of my skin tones. It's also starting to get us some of the tablecloth though. So I might wanna go back till we lose that tablecloth. There we go. And then maybe extend this a little bit maybe even also try sliding it. So sliding it can change what's selected. That's looking a little bit better, maybe a little bit wider. There we go. Bring that in a little. Okay. And then down here is lumen. So this is how bright something is. So you can see down here, it's very dark up here. It's very light. So we want to expand this as well to get more lumens and then we can sort of feather it out this isn't exactly feathering i'm calling it feathering but it's actually just softly selecting this area versus hardly if i did this it would be a little bit more hard but here you can see it's kind of making a little bit of a gradient of the selection so let's go still not getting all of my cheek here let's try expanding this no that's not doing it. Oh, there we go. So if we expand the saturation a bit and you really have to play with these and you know, you kind of have to work back and forth and change your selection as you go. Okay, make it a little smaller. Let's make this a little smaller. See if we, there we go. Now we're losing the tablecloth. All right, so that's not too bad. We could definitely get more fine tuned with it, but for now I'm just gonna stick with this because it can take a while to really get the proper selection. But now that we basically have my skin tone selected here, you're gonna scroll down and you can refine and you can denoise if you feel that it's noisy. I don't normally need to adjust that, but I do like to add a blur. And what a blur will do is it's just going to soften this so that you don't have crazy hard edges in your mat. So. I think 10 looked good. All right. And then down here is where you're going to color correct it. So now that we've made our selection, I'm going to uncheck show mask. And now I can make adjustments. So I can manually use this color wheel to make adjustments. I can adjust just the temperature. So you can see here what's selected. You can see we would definitely want to do a better job of making sure we get all of my skin tones. Otherwise, a correction is only going to affect part of it. But for our purposes right now, that's fine. 
we can saturate it more. Sometimes if my, I'm looking kind of reddish, I'll desaturate a little bit. So maybe like that, if I feel like I'm too red, that can help. Or you can, like I said, take the color wheel, cool off our selection so that you can see in the face here, really cools off my skin tones. But basically with color correction, the most important thing is skin tones. So you wanna make sure that those look natural and right. And my skin tones actually look pretty good here. They might be a little saturated, so let's bring it back down to 95. Otherwise, I think they look all right. But this is a great tool to use if you need to select a specific color. Something that happens to me a lot is this little dinosaur dude gets really yellow, and so it can help to select him. Sometimes he looks kind of orangey if I have a color cast, and this helps me just select that and bring him back to yellow. And then finally, if you want to add a vignette, you can do so by dragging it. You wanna drag it to the left, not to the right, because to the right is actually going to add white. Why anyone would want this, I don't know, but, <laughs> You can add one, and again, this is less is more. It's very heavy-handed, so I'll just add a lot just so you can see the other features. If we add a lot, we can also manipulate the midpoint, which will help you bring it in and out. You can manipulate the roundness and the feather. So it can be really hard if you want it really hard or really light. I don't necessarily love the vignette feature. Sometimes I make my own vignette that I bring in as a layer on top of my adjustment layer. So I just make it in Photoshop. So that way it's getting exactly what I want because sometimes this vignette doesn't really give you a ton of control that I would like. So that's one option too. You can make your own PNG file and bring it in and put it on top of your footage if you want a little more precise control. But that's a basic color correction that you can do. You know, of course, if you want crazier looks, you can get into crazier looks with your creatives tab here. But overall, this is how to do a basic color correction. And let's see where we started. We started there and now we're here. And that's the basics of color correction. And if you have some filmmaking questions you want answered, leave a comment below. I'd love to feature your question in a future video and answer it for you. And also don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell to give me a ring. Oh, I mean this kind of ring, not this kind of ring. <laughs> now get out there and film it yourself. Oh, uh, no, no, I, I said this kind of ring. Whatever, I'll call you back.